Hi, it's Dr. Z. In this video, I will review the third type of t-test. By the end of this video, you'll be able to conduct a two-tailed t-test for independent means. Please print the corresponding handout for this video and feel free to pause the video at any time to take notes on the handout. A t-test allows researchers to conduct a hypothesis test when population variance, or sigma squared, is not known. There are three different types of t-tests. The third type is known as the t-test for independent means. In its simplest form, there are two separate samples being compared in this t-test. Examples include comparing men and women and control groups versus treatment groups. This video will explain how researchers can do that. The third type of t-test is called a t-test for independent means. Let's break it down into its four parts. First, the t refers to the fact that we do not know population variance. Second, the word test is referring to a hypothesis test. So we will be using the four step procedure that we've already learned. Third, the word independent refers to two separate or independent samples. And finally, we will calculate the sample mean of each separate sample. When put all together, this is the definition for a t-test for independent means. Like in this photo, Donatello and Leonardo are two very different Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Just like this t-test compares two different groups. Because we're comparing two separate groups, this test is most often a two-tailed test. This test is also referred to as an independent t-test. Before we review the hypothesis test, there is one important distinction about this t-test that needs to be reviewed first. Since there are two separate groups being compared, like these two different apples, the researcher needs to differentiate between these two groups. First, notation will be used to indicate which group is which by using subscripts. For example, there will be two sample sizes and then two estimated population variances, so we'll use subscripts 1 and 2 to differentiate. Second, we will have two samples and therefore two sample means. Since we're comparing the samples to each other to determine if there's a difference between the two, we will use m subscript 1 minus m subscript 2 to express this comparison and notation. Similarly, if we could apply this entire study to the population, we would be comparing the difference between the two population means. So we will use mu subscript 1 minus mu subscript 2 to express this notation in comparison. This diagram illustrates the process of hypothesis testing. We will use the same four steps in conducting a t-test for independent means. Well, with some modifications along the way to make it clear that we're comparing two separate groups or two separate samples. Step one, the yellow Lego is to state hypotheses. Since we are comparing the difference between two groups, we are measuring the difference between the sample means. To determine the difference between two values, we will subtract them from each other. Therefore, the written statement for the null hypothesis must include the word difference. If there truly is no difference between the hypothetical population mean, then the difference between the means, when they're subtracted from each other, will equal zero. For example, if mu one or mu subscript 1 is 20, and mu subscript 2 is 20, they're exactly the same. Populations are not different. There is no difference. And therefore, when subtracted from each other, 20 minus 20 equals 0. The research hypothesis will reflect that there is a difference between the two samples. And in notation, if there is a difference between the population means, it will not equal 0. Step two, the blue Lego, is to set the criteria to make a decision whether the study worked or not. This step has modifications. 
because we're comparing two separate groups. First, we will still set our significance level P as we did for previous t-tests. Second, we will have our first modification. Yes, we will calculate degrees of freedom, but we'll do it with this new formula that reflects that we now have two samples. df subscript total equals the degrees of freedom for the first sample plus the degrees of freedom for the second sample. Recall that degrees of freedom is n minus 1. So you would do n minus 1 for each sample and then add those two numbers together. Third, we'll find the critical region t using df total. The star here is to remind you of this important modification that students commonly forget. So let's go to step three, the red Lego is to collect data and calculate sample statistics. This step has significant modifications because we have to count for two separate samples now. Well, we will still calculate estimated population variance, but now we're gonna call it pooled variance. The word pooled refers to two things being averaged together. So for a one sample t-test, estimated population variance in notation was s squared. Now, in notation, it is s2 pooled, again referring to the fact that we're pooling the variance together. Because we are averaging or pooling the two estimated population variances. The new formula here basically combines the estimated population variance for the first sample and for the second sample into one formula. Second, we will calculate estimated standard error. For a one sample t-test, estimated standard error notation was S subscript one. Well, we're gonna replace the M with the word difference now, where we're measuring the difference between the two sample means. In other words, we're adding the two estimated standard errors together. This new formula looks a bit overwhelming because it's combining the estimated standard errors for the first sample and for the second sample into one single formula. Third, we will calculate the t-score to determine the difference between the sample means with this modified formula. And finally, step four, the green Lego is making a decision about whether the study worked or not. Guess what? This step stays the same as it would for the previous two t-tests. Now that we've reviewed the steps of a t-test for independent means, are you ready to practice your new knowledge? I have one practice example for you to review. This is a short summary of the four steps that we described above. Please note that these steps are for a two-tailed t-test for independent means. Modifications for this test are noted in bold. Please pause the video to write down these steps on the video handout. This lecture example wants to study the effect of cognitive behavior therapy on depression. Since we do not know what effect CBT will have on depression, we will conduct a two-tailed test with non-directional hypotheses. The details of this research study are also provided in your video handout. The study will be comparing two separate groups, the CBT group, which is considered the treatment group, and the control group. After six weeks, both samples reported their scores on the Beck Depression Inventory. I encourage you to pause the video here and try to do the four steps on your own first. Then resume the video to show the answers. Step one, since we're studying if there is a difference between the two groups on depression, the hypotheses will include these variables. In notation, if there is no difference between both groups, then the difference will equal zero. Notice that the subscripts here still remain one and two because they differentiate between the two groups. 
The research hypothesis will reflect that there is a difference between the two groups. In notation, if there is a difference between the two groups, then the difference will not equal zero. Step two, as a researcher, we get to decide the significance level, and the preferred one is 0 0.05. Second, the degrees of freedom total is calculated, which is 28. Since we do not know if CBT will increase or decrease depression, we need to draw a critical region T for both tails, above and below the mean. The corresponding T scores for a 0.05 significance level, two tails, for a degrees of freedom 28, is T equals plus or minus 2.049. The box indicates the final answer that I'll be looking for on problem sets and exams. Step three. There are several new formulas in this step. I encourage you to slow down when doing your calculations. First, we will calculate pooled variance. Second, we will calculate estimated standard error. And finally, we will use the modified t-score formula that allows us to compare the two sample means. We calculate using all these values, and the t-score for the sample is t equals negative 3.92. The box indicates the final answer. Step four, now we need to compare the sample t-score that we calculated in step three to the population prediction which we determined in step two. In other words, does the t of negative 3.92 fall in the critical region t from step two? Since the values below the mean in the tail past the t critical region of a negative 2.049, the answer is yes and the decision is to reject the null hypothesis. The box here indicates the final answer that I'll be looking for on problem sets and exams. More specifically, let's talk about this t-score that has a negative value. Well, a negative value tells us that depression decreased. Since depression decreased, we need to decide which group had the decrease. So you need to ask which group has the lower sample mean. The CBT group had a mean of 68, which is lower than the control group that had a mean of 72. This means that the CBT group had a decrease in depression. After a hypothesis test is conducted, the researcher must calculate effect size, as well as report and interpret the results of the study. A good ethical researcher must always calculate effect size. Because we're comparing two separate samples, there will be a new formula for effect size, or estimated D. Please pause the video to write down these steps on the video handout. Now, let's briefly calculate effect size for this test. Using the modified formula for comparing two separate samples, we will calculate effect size. While the estimated D results in a negative value, we always report effect size as a positive value. The box indicates the final numerical answer. This numerical answer will be reported in the summary statement. Please see the chart from chapter six to determine whether the size of the effect is small, medium, or large. This verbal description of effect size will be used in the interpretation statement. Finally, Let's practice those summary and interpretation statements. There are two new items to include in the summary statement. First, we must report the sample means of both groups in the first sentence. Second, we must report DF total in the second sentence. I encourage you to pause the video here and try to write these statements on your own first. Then resume the video to show the answers. The summary statement will consist of two sentences. The first sentence will report the means of both samples. The second sentence will report the t-score, degrees of freedom total, significance level used, the decision you made, 
and the effect size, or estimated D. The second sentence must also include the word difference because we're comparing two groups now. The interpretation statement will explain that depression decreased in the CBT group as compared to the control group. It is important to include the second group that you're comparing to. The second sentence will explain the effect size. In summary, research studies may want to explore the difference between two separate groups. A t-test for independent means allows for the study of these comparisons. Learning how to conduct an independent t-test is one more important Lego building block needed to understand statistics.